You're listening to Earnestly Speaking, the only weekly podcast that covers friends, foes, and anything that goes. And now, for your badass host, Ernest Owens. And we're back for another episode of Earnestly Speaking with your host, Ernest Owens, myself. (laughs) Well, 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 Libra season definitely was a super success, if I do say so myself. I really, really, really enjoyed myself this past season. Um, October was just a really good month in general. I mean, I think we still got a week left of of October. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely, you know, be doing more podcasting, of course, for this month. But, I mean, just Libra season was phenomenal. I have no complaints. I really don't. I really... I have appreciated just the fun. It's just been a lot of fun. Just a lot of just social activity and things. I mean, just a lot of news in general, too. I mean, this has also been a very crazy news month in general. But I feel like it's because it's the return to fall. So now everybody wants to make announcements. And there will be more announcements coming actually very soon um, with, you know, upcoming mayoral races and political races and whatnot. So it's a lot going on in general, but I've just been, you know, relaxing and, you know, making it happen. So I've done some cool stuff this week. Uh, of course, I got my monthly CBD oil, massage, sea salt, Himalayan, hot Himalayan sea salt stones. I'm all into it. Two hours. Got it at Hand and Stone, which is my go-to masseuse. Uh, spot in Philly. Don't tell me about other places. My girl Carmen, she knows me. She knows my my body. She knows my back. She knows she knows where it's at. So she has been very great. I've been going there for over two years now. I have the same masseuse. I've been loyal. I'm a Libra, so I'm just consistent with what I'm into. I mean, sometimes my interests might change in different areas, and I and I like to experiment, but. I'm very steadfast. I've had the same masseuse for two years. I've had the same barber for 12 years. I've had the same man for over eight years. I'm very consistent. <laughs> and, and some friends I've kept, friendships I've kept for, for over 15 years and, and over 10 years. Most of my friendships, I will say, have been over, definitely over five years. I've kept, um, and I've kept some others. But you're you're talking to someone that's 31. So don't, don't you know, be like, well, I've got, listen, as a 31-year-old, I will tell you, it is not easy to keep a lot of friends over 10 years. It is not because people, you know, a lot of people in that, in that rightfully so evolve and change. So it's, but you know, we have good taste and you have a good keen eye for what's real. Realness will, will, will stand the test of time. That's what I believe at least. Um, so yes, I, I definitely did that. I also did something also different. I did an oral reading. So it was gifted to me. Um, for for my anniversary, Mr. Johnson, and we did like a couples, uh, not couples, it was just us as a couple, but we didn't have anyone else. But we did a, a oral reading, which I don't know much about it, but it was <laughs> I did it right. So what we did was we we went to this this woman. She does it. She's her. She's great. Her name is Sarah Silverman, not the problematic, annoying ass comedian. But another, and she spells her name S-A-R-A, not like Sarah, like Sarah Silverman. But she uh, has a company called Inner Light, and they do aura readings. So A-U-R-A, and you should check them out. It's called Inner Light. It's her company, woman-owned, um, very, very, uh, just a very good reader. So she did our aura readings. And so we went to her studio, and it's in Redden House. We went there. We sat, um, we did, we put our hands on this, like, uh, I don't know, I guess this, the aura tracer, but we sat down and we put our hands on these, like these, these metal things that like, I guess took our, you know, you know, energy or whatever we, and then we took a picture and, uh, it was like a, one of those, uh, Polaroid, not a Polaroid camera, but one of those Polaroid camera, uh, production, not the individual solo ones, but it was like a Polaroid but it was special. It was one of those special ones that, like, it reads the way it takes in color and hues based off of the pressure of the hands. I don't, I, I didn't go, uh, read all into the details of it. I just went through it. It was a gift. I didn't want to waste the gift. I don't waste gifts if, if possible. Um, so we did it. 
So then afterwards, the photos come and it's like different colors and different things. And so she read the colors based off of chakra. It was like the, the measurement of the colors. And she was telling us what the color symbolizes and what it means. And so if you went on my Instagram, you saw the photos. Together, we are just the most harmonious, energized couple. And individually, we are very imaginative and creative. And it was good. It was a good reading um, for what it's worth. I mean, if you're not into it, you don't believe it. I get it. I, I just find it fascinating. Whether I mean, it's fun. And the re- I will say, though, the reading was reading, okay? She was definitely reading me. And for people to understand what reading means, reading means exactly that. Like, you know how someone is reading a tarot card or, or any type of card and they're doing a the reading? That's where that origin of that term is in Black queer vernacular. So when we say someone is reading you the filth, it's com- the reading is not like reading a book. It's the reading of like a tarot card reading or a oral reading. I don't, you know, take it for what it's worth. Some of you cishets who like to use these the, these terms and don't know where they're coming from. That's what we mean by we're reading someone. So if I say I'm reading you the filth, it's like tarot card will do the readings, right? When the cards, and for all of my queer folks who are here listening to this segment of the podcast and going, duh, listen, the duh is not for everybody's duh. Everybody's duh could be ah for some people. But that's what it means by reading someone. So we was being read. In a good way. We was not being read to filth. We was being read into fantastic, I suppose. But it was a nice reading. It was very fun and very creative. And I found it to be uh, enlightening. Enlightening. Will I do it again? I don't know. But it was fun to just be able to do something different than I hadn't done. Um, which made it all the better. Um, yeah, so that was awesome. And I did feel like our auras... I knew our auras was going to align because of what happened last week. So we call ourselves, you know, planning this wedding gifts. And then we had the same exact anniversary gifts that for each other. It was, a, it was, a, it was, a, and it, what was even, even funnier was that there were star constellations. And so basically we had the exact same constellation as we remember for our wedding. It was exact identical. And we've had the identical, it's the same identical gift. So clearly our stars and our world, our aura is aligned. Beautiful. Yay, astrology. So, so yeah, I did that. I got a, you know, I took a lot of time just relaxing this weekend. I mean, I did a couple of things. So, like, I went, so I had a dinner with my board, uh, Philadelphia Association, a Black journalist, our executive board. We got together um, and had a dinner at City Winery. It was a private dinner. And you all know I have, I have, I have I've talked about City, City Winery. I will say this. I, I, well, I, we had a good time. We had a good time. It was, it was a good time for us. And I'll say that. Is it some place that I will go personally by myself? No, because there's other options to go to. Um, It's good if you are like having a group gathering and you need space and you don't want all the fuss and the, and the pomp and circumstance. That I will say. And we had this, we had a cool dinner. It was the dinner the food was, was, it was standard, standard. And what was great about it the most was just to be around people. But like we had, we, you know, we had a limited wine. We had wine pairings to go with the meals. We had lots of wine, lots of drinking. It's a no fuss frills gathering spot, I would say. It's not, some people go for the concerts and the shows, which if you are a concert person, by all means, they, they do have some good artists there. So I would not say that. I, I would definitely say if you want to go to a show. But if you want to go on a date night and you, you know, you you want to have food that you really, really like, see, we're going to talk about this a little bit later in the show about this debate on fine dining. And of course, my viral post I made. But I would just say that it's good for a gathering. It, it did we need to do last night. But like, personally, if I would go on a date or something, no. Um, one of my good friends, Lauren, had her birthday party last year, her 30th birthday. Now, that was good because it was like a lot of heavy hors d'oeuvres and we had the space. And so I think for renting out spaces and things like that, it's great for that. But intimate, like, is it the place I'm going to run to by myself? No. They do have wine. The wine was good. Um, And so I guess if you're a wine person, maybe, because there is a lot of wine in City Winery. Their cocktails, they're okay. But... <laughs> You know, it was fun for what it was giving. It was a perfect Saturday night gathering of like what was ten of us. That that I loved. So I will I will give them that. 
Lit Brothers and I went to a fun event. Uh, we went to the premiere um, in Philly of Ticket to Paradise. Uh, it was at the Comcast building. Very, very fun little place. Uh, very, very fun gathering. We was like, and I'll be talking more about the film. Um, I did see it. I'll give you what I thought about the film because everyone's been talking about it. It's got George Clooney, Julia Roberts, and it was it was pretty solid. It was it was pretty solid um, as a film. But I, I have other thoughts about it. But I will save that for later in the show. But we went to the premiere. It was super super dope. Uh, good vibes across the board. Um, and, and just, and just fun, just lots of fun. This week was very, very fun, uh, for so many different reasons. One of them I will tell you was I'm on TikTok. Yes, I'm on TikTok. I know, I know. I've said so many things about it. Let me just say this. I got a book coming out, so I can't play games. And I've been studying TikTok for the past several months, you know, before I did my leap. But, you know, we're less than four months away from the book. The book comes out, as you all know, February 21st, 2023. As you see, we're less than four four months away. So the countdown is here. And one thing about TikTok that I've been following is that there's a culture of uh, called Book Talk, which if you're on TikTok already, you already know what I'm talking about. Well, Book Talk is also a thing. And a lot of people, um, you know was like, hey, you know, you should check it out for the for as an opportunity to promote your book and talk about your book. And I'm like, yeah, there is a culture out there of people who are really into book talk and, and book culture. And I hadn't been for a minute, you know, I didn't know, you know, which one I was gonna go for, but it is a it is a thing. It, it is a real thing. I've been on the app just checking it out and just studying the culture and the and the fandom around it. But there are people who are really into books and different subcultures and genres of books. So, you know, I'm an adult nonfiction, progressive black queer journalist, and it's been a lot of love on here. I must say every video that I have on TikTok um, has over 2000 views. Most of them have over 4000. Um, some even have higher, but I've only done a couple of videos, but all of my videos on average have over 2000 views. Um, more of which, a lot of them, a lot. So I'm on TikTok. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm still figuring out my identity on it, but really I think I'm just going to be the person that's going to give people some great facts some great information and insight. Uh, definitely going to talk about books and all the dope stuff with that. Um, all of my foodie stuff will definitely stay on my Instagram. I am not using this as an opportunity to just splurge all of my life. I think I do a lot of that already with Instagram. And so it's like Instagram story has that purpose. I think TikTok is just an opportunity for me to just, you know, talk about a couple of cool little things that's going on in the world and also really connect it to my book and really connect with the book talkers that are there. Um, but it's 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 my least favorite app, as you can imagine. Um, I I I just hate... I don't hate video. I just feel like it just takes more work than needs to. And I'm not the, like Twitter. I get on Twitter. I, I tweet. The ideas go out there. Shit goes viral. And I'm chilling, right? And there's real meaningful conversation on there. Instagram, I have found my Instagram groove. I just basically send you all screenshots of my tweets and also, you know, cool announcements and cool graphic visual. I'm very heavy on photos on Instagram. That's what I love. I love Instagram for the infographics, for the the photos and the cool pictures. All of these reels, I mean, Instagram is really trying to force reels because they're trying to compete with TikTok. It's over. Like, uh, and I hate it. And some of my friends have had to, you know, because they're influencers, they've had to convert to reels on Instagram. People don't like, I mean, videos on Instagram are okay, but I, I'm just still all about the visual as in photos and infographics and messages and words. That's what made Instagram beautiful because you could consume information visually. Just like, oh, you know, people are making announcements. It was the perfect place to put flyers, you know, because it's Twitter you can, you know, for whatever, but Twitter is about text. And there's a couple people that put some Twitter. I mean, Twitter does have good videos like news clips. So if you are on Twitter, you put videos up. 
a lot of videos are okay on Twitter, but you only put videos up on Twitter that are like the best videos are news based videos or or you know people a viral video of someone getting caught doing something. I, I love Twitter because news is what drives it. There's a couple of people that get a little sarcastic and silly, but news is what drives Twitter. Ideas and news. It's my favorite app, Twitter. I just, I keep praising Twitter, okay? Facebook, you know, Facebook is, I've I've definitely have fallen out of love with Facebook. I just have to say it. Facebook, there's still a purpose, I suppose, but, like, Facebook doesn't drive the conversation. Like, everybody knows, like, real rap, I don't care about what the kids are saying. Twitter drives the conversation. We, we, like, all, Twitter is, like, the most important app to me as far as the conversations. I mean, you don't get Black Lives Matter as a hashtag. You don't even get hashtags without Twitter. Like, Twitter is just, it's it's everything. And, yes, I know Elon Musk is about to be close to buying it apparently now. Ugh, I don't even want to think about that, but just Twitter is where it's at. And once I cracked the Da Vinci Code on Twitter, I was I, I was in love. Okay. Instagram, I got love for Instagram. I find Instagram fun because of the visual aspect of it. I hate that they're trying to force reels on there because that's not what it's for. And that's gonna back that's gonna backpedal eventually because these algorithms and all this shit, people can get tired of that. Okay. It's a place to put pictures and to be nosy. Because I, I see a lot of things on that Instagram that be making me go, hmm. Um, and then there's Facebook. You know, Facebook, like I said before, Facebook's the place where I put a lot of my, you know, updates, personal updates, you know, career updates and things. I mean, I do on all of them, but like really Facebook's the place for me to just catch up with close friends and family. And that's where like I look at, I look at the place as like, this is the most family familiar social outlet. Like Twitter is the wild, wild west. If you're a friend or family, like messaging me and talking to me on Twitter, eh, DMs. I do more inner. I do more conversations and DMs with friends, talking about what's out there on Twitter than I actually do on the on the public facingness of it. Because Twitter is such a very public facing app. Uh, Facebook, I get more intimate because there's friends. I really only add my friends and people I know on my Facebook. So if I don't really know somebody in the same network as them. I really don't see the point. Um, I, I see that Instagram. It's a combination of both, but it's more so just me putting out what I want to put out and people just digesting it. I don't really do much conversation on Instagram. I mean, the DMs I do, but like not on the page. It's like I just put out what I want to put out and it's the most, it's the easiest, most like stressless, I mean, stress freeness of the app. It's just like I put pictures up and I always had some people like, oh, people put so much thought into their fucking pictures on Instagram. As somebody who just goes and do it, I don't even probably put that many pictures of myself on Instagram. It's not about me. It's about ideas. But if you are, like I tell people all the time, that's the part about social media I don't like is that people put a little bit too much work into it without being paid. Now, if I'm being paid to promote or being paid to do something on my social media, yeah, I'm going to put a little bit more thought into it because it's a job. Or a gig at that point. But if it's not a gig, I'm not going to beat myself up. There was a girl that I knew in college. And is and she's not in my immediate friend circle. So, Because when I say this, some of my friends are going to be like, you talking about? No, but you also do it too. But this but this person was zero at this. This girl, um, she's younger than me. She, she, she was class of 15. So we would go out. We would, you know, when I was in college, we'd go out to some events and things. And she had a thing with like, oh, she wanted me to take a thousand pictures of her. Now, I get it. Some people always want to have their little solo shot and a picture. I'm all I'm all about that. Get your po- get your photo. Now, personally, I'm a one, I'm if I if I if I, if the scene is right and the vibe is right, I'm a one, two, snap, snap, I'm done person. I'm not. Life is too short to be, you know, spending mindless minutes and, and hours trying to take photos that, like, you're going to... Mm. Anywho, I, this girl would wanted a thousand photos. I was like, get over your fucking... T-. At one point, it got to the point where it was like, I took a bunch of pictures. Now, I swear, I, I tell you, I took the... I swear I took the same photo with the same angle a bunch of times. Then she wanted a several. And then she looked through all of them and said that... Oh, I don't look good here. I don't look good. And, you know, okay, we take this. I said, you know what? This is becoming a photo shoot. And clearly, there's nothing that I'm going to take in this photo that's going to make you feel any better about how you look then or there. If you have an image issue and there's something that you're just, you don't like about how you look, 
the, no photo of what I could do a thousand different times and angles is going to fucking work. And that, that there needs to be some work. You don't need a photographer. You need a therapist. Like, I don't know what to say. Like, at, at some point, you know, and I don't know if it's body dysmorphia. I don't know if it's other issues that could be at play. But, like, at some point, you just have to respect people's time. And I remember in college, I didn't have the words to say, this is ridiculous. Because I was just thinking that this is the norm because everybody wanted a thousand photos. And it's like, I get it, right? You come somewhere, you want to take different pictures, whatever. But at some point, you have to get a fucking grip. And you have to get some self-esteem. And I say that with love because as somebody who has done this a thousand times, I'm just like, whatever you're trying to achieve in that photo, it is a cell phone and we're on a corner. (laughs) Like, like, it's just too much. And then there's so much hyper editing on photos. I just, ah, oh, I just want people to love themselves. I need people to put themselves in positions to get resources to get to the place of loving themselves. Like, it, it, it's a give or take, but you got to get there because that's 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 you know it's it. I, what I will say to anybody, and then this is not me putting out any type of. Um, I'll just say it like this. I think where we are in this generation, especially with my millennials, I, the Gen Zers, they're just Gen Zing right now. My brother's a Gen Zer. He's he's having a time. He's came over for dinner. Um, he was at uh well, I guess I'll get to the homecoming stuff in a minute. But anywho, Gen Zers are Gen Zing. But for my millennials, like we've we are a special group because we came from being the considered the ungrateful generation. Our parents you know, claimed that we felt so entitled, but then they forgot that they made us that way by, like, giving us gold stars for everything, whatever. We're at a point now where we've done so much based on other people's expectations. I just need us as a generation to invest in getting real support and help for the things that we antagonize ourselves over. It's not a good look. I, I've seen I've seen so many people like I went to Penn Homecoming this weekend. So I guess this comes high in. Every time I go to Penn Homecoming, it's always just interesting. It's like a, almost like a seeing how so much change, so much doesn't change. And I bumped into a couple of people I recognized. And um Yeah, it was it was it's always interesting. I wasn't doing too much. It was this uh, this year. Because homecoming just seemed very, like... There was, like, a dark cloud of a homecoming this year. And I think part of it is because we have a new president. I feel Dr. Amy Gutman's absence at Penn. I will say that. You do feel it. There's, like, a little bit of magic that feels like it's not there anymore. Like, there's, like, somebody else is there. And people are trying to embrace this new president. I'm not impressed, personally, so far. It just... The way that stuff has been handled with the UC townhomes, all the other issues on campus with carbon, I just feel like... And then I'm hearing about students being, you know, investigated and stuff for speaking out. I, I'm just not really feeling this new era of this new president. I don't know. It just seems like... Ugh, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, look, she just started, so I don't want to get too hard. But I'm just not... So far, I'm not impressed. Um... The campus was had a, a occupation of of they they did a student encampment on College Green with tents and signs calling out a lot of the gentrification and divestment. I'm very proud of this group. Okay, the future is bright. I I, I put up a tweet that said you know a very happy whole coming from Penn and it was based in pictures of the encampments on College Green, which I, I thought was important and powerful. So that was. That was good. And what was interesting was because they had the encampments there, they relocated the party elsewhere because the encampments took over. And I was very happy to see that activism still going strong. Um, Myself and Mr. Johnson, both of us are Penn alum. We got a black pin hoodie, which, not hoodie, a sweater. It was a big black sweatshirt. Apparently the students on campus are are identifying as black pin, which is like, they got these cool sweatshirts. It's been really hot. I saw them. I was like, would I get one? And I was, I got one. They gave me one. I felt like an honorary. So that was cute. And so we both got those. But I, I, I say all that to say that what I did notice in catching up with friends and folks that I've known over the years is that a lot of people are doing everything in their power to try to alter and edit and revise their shitty lives or experiences um, or or self-esteem issues 
rather than actually investing in doing some real work. And I'm talking about the criminal crypt. These are people who have, you know, insurance and resources to get therapy or to 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 really do some real life, you know, seeking and guiding. Like there's no excuse for them to do these things. And I, one thing that has been a, a pet peeve of mine are people who are just super self-critical publicly. I, I I hate to see a person beat themselves up out loud consistently. I don't find self-deprecating behavior a personality trait that is that is something that people should like like treat as okay. I think it's not okay to consistently shit on yourself. I know it's a natural thing that people do. I many 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 years ago got past that point. You're not going to hear me shit on myself. Unless I'm being accountable for a mistake, because that's important. Like, don't be arrogant. But at the same time, I'm I'm not going to beat myself up publicly. As a black queer man, the world is already doing enough of that on people that look like me every day. I don't need to join the symphony, symp- the symphony of people uh, to also be a part of that. I get enough people that would sell, talk shit about me every day. I don't need to be one of the people doing it to myself. And so, I don't know, something in me just felt like I should say that. Because a lot of times, I just hear people just make it a point to just shit on themselves. And that is not cool. That's not cute. I remember when I was when I was single, I dated a guy who, I was like, oh, he's, you know, I thought he looked good. Seemed like a decent man. Very nice. You know, very chill. But he always was hypercritical by himself. And it turned me off. I, I must say, it turned me off. I was just like... You just, I mean, it's 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 okay. It's okay to like be re- acknowledged certain things, but I mean, he was just super, just hard on himself. And I and not that you know people do the whole well. If he's like that with himself, would he be like that with you? Listen, I wasn't gonna wait to see and find out. But all I know is, I like I I I, I like a cheat. I like a chill, ease, easy people. You know, like it's so. Don't 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 spend so much time picking at yourself. My goodness, like I just I I don't know. I, I I think confidence and self confidence is magnetic. It 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 goes. People feel your your self confidence radiates to other people, and and that's what I feel like I am to a lot of people I know in my life. I I think I radiated on others and and hopefully inspire them to 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 do the same. Because like I said, if you are a woman in this world, if you are black, if you are queer, if you're all of those things or some of those things. You know, you there's a lot of people in the world that's gonna tell you 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 ain't shit or or you're not good or whatever. I don't have time. I don't have time. I I, I don't. Um. So yeah, I just want to put that out there. Um. So outside of that, uh, I guess you know, book the book the book more is coming. So I will tell a lot of of you this who's listening to this podcast. There will be an event, a kickoff. Now I've been hinting about this, but but we're getting close and close. There will be a event. There will be a huge kickoff on the day the book comes out, February twenty first. We are less than four months away. I'm telling you right now to save the date. There will be a private event, top of the top, creme de la creme. I will have invitations. You know I love to invite people. This will be a huge event in addition to other events that will be taking place all throughout Philadelphia and beyond. Okay, we're talking to the West Coast right now. We're talking to the South. We're talking to other parts of the East. It's it's some stuff coming. that we're, 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 we're getting geared up. We're getting loaded. We're getting ready. Something's coming. So all I will say is, is that if you are a PR person... If you are uh, somebody who throws events, you don't want to throw anything on Tuesday, February 21st, 2023. You just don't want to do that to yourself. You don't want to play yourself like that. Don't even think that you're going to have an event and you're going to have a a group of people. You need to clear your calendar out that day. Everybody needs to clear their calendar out that day. Unless unless it's like, you know, because wherever, whatever, that evening, that evening of the 21st, I don't know who's going to be there. Who's going to go to your events? I mean, maybe you'll have some food TikTokers or something. I don't know. Because that event that's coming, this this book premiere, this launch, just is going to be epic. It's going to be somewhere epic. I, I can't tell you where it's going to be, but it's going to be somewhere epic. And there's going to be icons. Icons. It's legends only at this party. This is going to be epic. 
it's going to be magnificent. It's going to be newsworthy. It's going to be all the buzz. And all I'm saying to, to PR folks who throw events all the time sporadically with these cattle calls and all that whatnot, I'm just saying that's not the day that you don't don't sit around and talk about some. Where's Ernest at? Where's Ernest? Ernest is 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 at the event that all your other peers are. <laughs> so, just wanted to put that out there. Um, but super excited. Lots of of good things are happening, as you can see. I, I'm just I'm just doing the damn thing. I'm having fun. It's more to come. More to come. So, I want to talk about Trump because Trump has been subpoenaed for the January 6th commission. They're subpoenaing him to talk and testify. As you all probably saw earlier this week, Steve Bannon, okay, was given a sentence in prison, like about four months, y'all. But his failure to show up to the subpoena and participate, um, you know, he is being defiant and subordinate. And you know, that comes with a penalty. So four months behind bars, he is going to be serving. Like this man does, I mean, listen, this, these ride or dies for Trump are ride or dies to the fullest. I mean, they don't give no fucks, but... They now have subpoenaed um, Trump. Um, people are saying that they don't think he's going to end up testifying. He probably will not. I got excited when I got the notification, but his his ability to do that is like, well, what's going to be the consequences? What are the legal ramifications for whether or not Trump decides to participate in this or not? It's very big. It's it's huge. And you know where I stand on it is is that we're getting you know there's so much stuff going going at him. The family is being investigated by, of course, my favorite AG. Um, you know we're we're going to see all of these things come together, and you know I, I've I've been telling people for a long time that this that I, I don't think I don't know I don't think that he is going to he's going to bend. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if he's going to bend. I don't, I don't know if he's going to do what, 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 I mean, I feel like, I, I think about people like Letitia James, who's the attorney general, my, that, not Josh Shapiro. I mean, for governor, yes, because unfortunately, look who's the other alternative. But for Letitia James, the AG in New York, of New York State, she's coming at his businesses. The government is investigating his other behavior. There's a lot of things happening right now in this moment in time. I don't think he's going to make it to president. I mean, there's rumors that Marjorie Taylor Greene or Green Taylor, whatever the fuck her name is, this woman, okay, who's over in Alabama or Georgia. She's in Georgia. I can't keep up with this idiot. She is going to be his running mate. I mean, idealist, idealistically. But even though it looked like for many, for a little bit, he was kind of not trying to bang with her like that. Like he wasn't trying to be cool with her. But it seems like now he's found his his person because he realizes, okay, if Biden is running for re-election with Kamala by his side, I need to have a woman by my side to make my chances. And Mike Pence is clearly not going to be that guy. Like Mike Pence isn't happening, even though Mike Pence, I, you know, I'm not a fan. I don't care. Everyone wants to soften him and stuff now. I mm -mm, no, still talking shit. Still a problem. Not a fan. Um, but 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 there's there are people who think he might run for no. He's no. You're not running for re-election. You're not going to pull a Biden. You, you know, look, Obama was so good that his vice president still became president. Okay, and, and a lot of good currency came Biden's way because of his service for eight years as the VP of Obama. So I don't I there's no goodwill here with Trump and Pence. And Pence being his VP, being very quiet and passive and allow for all of that 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 goddamn no, not happening. So that's that. I mean, we'll see, but like honestly, I am the Trump train, I, I think people are really getting over it. But talk about getting over it. Okay, across the Atlantic, in Great Britain, the Prime Minister, Liz Truss, is no longer. She resigned. And and I was like, oh, wow. Like, uh, you know, she had a moment. I think they said she was there for, what, 44 days or something? Not that long. She was not that long in a position. I mean, this is after Boris Johnson, who was the what people considered the British Trump. He, of course, was ousted because he was a hot mess. And then she came into position, tried to fuck around with the economics really wild, and just did a lot of crazy tax cuts, put the whole whole euro in limbo, okay? And definitely put Great Britain's finances in limbo. Now they're a hot mess. 
Okay, a, a lettuce, a bit of lettuce, or a head of lettuce, outlasted her, apparently. She just fucked everything up, and now she's out. So, it's embarrassing, because she at first was acting like, you know, she's not a quitter. And then the next day, she quit. <laughs> but it just goes to show you that I, I think we're in an interesting phase right now in, 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 in world politics. Is that every time you think people really want this strong, conservative, radical approach, it's fading. It's fading. People are actually over. I thought we were, I mean, you know, fascism is always on the brink at any moment in this in this world we're in today. But it's interesting because some of these people, people are really over them. Like Boris Johnson and all that Brexit and all that. Folks are over it. And I will say, to to give Great Britain a little bit of credit, they turn their people over. Like the prime minister is like the president of of. They don't have a president in Great Britain. It's the prime minister serves in that kind of like presidential role. But like the fact that like you suck over there, you out. We don't have that in the United States. Bad presidents can do two terms and complete them. Bush, Trump, you know, finished a full term. He should have been out the first year. But over there, Great Britain, they, she's the shortest running, leading prime minister in the history. And she's going to be literally a, a not even a bookmark in a history chapter. She's probably going to have like a quarter of a page or just a page in the big book. Like her, that's how much impact she had and historic. And, and, just to, and just to think, you know, and then you got what's going on in Italy, but it's like, oh. Liz, what's going on? So I don't know who the new prime minister is going to be. I think there's somebody that's going to be coming, but just goodness. Like, I mean, there's something to be learned from that experience. I'll, I'll say that much. Just something to be learned from that. Um, speaking of setbacks and, and, and madness, Biden's huge student aid. It's on the sidelines right now. We don't know what's going to happen. It's, 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 it's wow. We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen right now. Oh my goodness. I, I, oof. You know, the courts right now, all I will say is, is that if you're somebody who was sitting down trying to figure out what's next, and you know who you are, some of you all, you know who you are. If you're somewhere, you know, counting sheep in your sleep and trying to figure out whether or not you're going to vote, as you can see before you, the way that voting is happening right now, the way that the politics are being set up right now in this country, we're at an interesting phase where all I'm saying is that there are people right now who are on the edge. And if you're if you're second guessing whether or not you should be voting in this upcoming election, I don't know what to tell you. Because this is literally a very consequential moment. And if they're trying to set back student loan uh, recovery for people right now and Biden and, and they have not taken over the Senate yet or anything of that nature. Can you imagine what's going to happen the moment, you know, you know, people are getting back in position. That's all I'm going to say. Think, think very long and hard and be very wise about what's coming up because there's some, I think conservatives that thought, Oh, I could get Biden's, you know, I could get Biden's thing and, you know, that will, you know, that will happen and everything's going to work out and blah, 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 blah. Mm -mm. No, you're not going to be able to get your, to benefit your stuff. If that makes sense. You're not going to be, you're not going to be able to get both worlds. You need to, to, to get together. Period. Period. So I'll say that much. Um... I think w one of the biggest things that have, that has shown me how important this election is is just seeing what's been happening with Ron DeSantis over there um, in Florida. He's been putting up bogus charges on people around voter fraud. Several people have now since then have beat the charges and have been okay. But this is basically, I think over 20 people so far under DeSantis has been been, you know, charged with voter fraud type of activity. Of course, they've gone to the judge, fought the cases. And this is happening in the middle of a midterm cycle, a midterm season. If there's any moment to question, any moment to, to, to second guess the ramifications and the severity of this election, I, I don't know what to tell you. 
I don't. I really don't. Like, if someone tell me, tell me why my vote matters, fuck you, is what I'm going to say to them. I know that's not the most civil way to respond, but I don't understand what more can happen. We, we saw what happened with Roe v. Wade this summer. We're seeing how they're acting about student loan debt. Like, one progressive move, they're doing everything in their power to try to stop it. They're cutting their nose to smite their face. And then they're benefiting off of the progress that that has slipped. You you see the stuff that's happening in New York. Like, there's people out here who are, like, doing the whole, oh, you know, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not going to do this. But at the same time, you know, parading around. It, it's just It's just so cringy. And they're getting bene- they're taking advantage of benefits and resources that they they speak against, they vote against. But but you're out here getting this relief. All these people. And then they want to complain about student debts when all these businesses got their fair share of, of hookups and everything. It's just to me, anybody who's questioning whether or not they should vote. Or questioning how serious this is. I know that the TV ads are annoying. Because trust me, I'm getting annoyed with them. But unfortunately, because people seem to be still dancing on whether or not this race is going to be close. So however it's going to play out. we we, we are, I, I can imagine that there will be runoffs. I don't want runoffs. But there's it's looking like there could be some runoffs. You know, maybe in Georgia. Hopefully not. But early voting is is wild. I know in Texas, there's like over a million new registered voters. There's there's an increased pie of people voting. There's some opportunity here because these polls. Everybody keeps talking about the polls, but I don't I don't trust the polls. I don't trust the polls. I I you know they're they're weird. They're shaky. They're they're all over the place. They're too close. I, I don't think anybody should rest their laurels on on polls right now. You should be running like you're ten, you're ten points down. <laughs> but no shade. When I was looking at that primary, some people were not even ten points down. They were like 20, 30 points down. They didn't have a chance in hell. And then we saw that in the primaries, you know. But 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 these races are not ten points down races. These are races that just look like they're just they're up up in a in a way. Um, but I also tell people you can. There's ways that you can skew data because it's like, well, where are you? doing these polls because if you did them in philly i mean they're skewed one way or undecided voters whatever i just wish people stop saying they're undecided i think there are people that say that because they it, it's like a way of being like a contrarian like be like like a sexy like oh i'm an undecided voter and and then when i see and i mm, i would just say there's certain marginalized groups where they'll be like i'm an undecided voter i'm like so you really are considering dr oz you're really gonna act like dr oz is like like you Black queer voter, you're undecided. You're not undecided. You're not undecided. Unless you're Christian Walker. But anyway, I digress. So in Philadelphia, there is this bombshell report. I knew this day was going to come. And I've, I've talked about a couple episodes hinting at this. But there is a bombshell police audit that came out of City Controller Rebecca Reinhardt's office. Now, I will say this. Because it is my podcast and I can do what I want. This might be the last time we would be calling her city controller, Rebecca Reinhardt. I sense that there will be some interesting changes that will be happening very fast. Um, And this might be the last time on this podcast that I would probably be calling her city controller, Rebecca Reinhardt. Is that a Freudian slip? I don't know. But city controller, Rebecca Reinhardt. Um, released a report, police audit, that was independently done, um, that basically got into what's going on in, in the uh, in the police department, the funding. I got a piece coming out later um, in the week coming out uh, uh, for uh, Philly Mag talking about this. And basically, the police department has nearly $800 million. $800 million okay, yes, they have nearly $800 million. And the bombshell report, and I keep calling this, this police audit that she has done for eight months is an independent review. It came out last week, and basically it revealed that there was a lack of transparency, outdated technology, and some alarming racial disparities in service. And none of us, as as a, as somebody who is for defunding the police, um, as somebody who is all about police accountability and also uh, abolition, but... You know, I I recognize that I'm practical on some of the aspects of like 
managing my personal political uh, vision for the future and the current realities of where we're where we're at, right? So for people like myself, advocates who've been considering efforts to defund the police because there's a lack of transparency, I felt like this report was just a testament to why the whole system needs needs reevaluation, reevaluation, like absolutely. Um, so I read the report, you know, the nerd in me read it all, but I, I am here for those who don't have time to read reports. I am here to tell you some of the highlights. So first of all, out of 6,000 uniformed officers that are on, that are, that are, that are in the force right now, only 2,500 of them, yes, less than 50% of them are actually on patrol. You heard that correctly. 2,500 out of 6,000 of the uniform officers that are currently in our orbit, in our city, are actually on the on the streets on a patrol. So when they talk about boots on the ground, baby, less than 50% of our officers are actually boots on the ground. That came out. Now, you might be wondering, where are the rest of them? Okay? The rest of them are doing jobs that do not actually require them to be at the police department, administrative jobs, all these types of like communication positions and all these other, you know, random ass jobs that are in the police department. A lot of those jobs do not actually require it to be under the police department budget or should be counted or, or jobs. These officers are doing jobs where they have a, a, a police badge and they're, you know, identified as an officer, but what they're actually doing is not something, a job that a cop, that we think a cop is doing. So when you ask people what you think most of this money is going to, 95% of the police budget is personnel in Philadelphia, which is 5% higher than the national average of 90%. But 95% of the budget is personnel. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, all this staff, all these people, all these jobs, and you mean tell me that what you think the police office is doing versus what they're really doing is different. Like somebody out here listening to this podcast, make me a graphic of like, you know how they say what you think you're doing, what you're what you what you're actually doing, and what people think you're doing. So long story short, you think the police office is looking like a scene from like, you know, um, I don't know, 911 with with Angela Bassett. You're thinking that it's law and order, you know, you, you think it's gonna be that, right? That's what you think they're doing. <laughs> but really, it looks like the office in that motherfucker. It looks like the office. They're they're actually sitting at desks doing things that are not actually fighting crime. Okay? And that's most of the job. So you think it they're out here fighting crime and, and arresting people and fixing. No. But see, here's the thing. I knew something was off in the police department, you know, thank goodness for this report and data to, to, to actually support what I knew for a while. But I'm fleshing this out here, right? So when there were reports that were saying that the conviction rate was like a third, a third of, of actual people in Philadelphia criminals are getting actually convicted or held accountable. I would say to myself, that is a very low number. Now, it can only be low like that for several reasons. Are the criminals too hard to find or are y'all just going to pull out a reason to blame Krasner? No. Take Krasner out of this for five seconds. Just focus on the fact that arrests. Oh, you you haven't got that many criminals off the streets. And now I understand why, quote unquote, you haven't got any criminals off the streets. Because only like less than half of you all are not actually out here in the streets recruitment has been down the reports show that each year it's been harder and harder for recruitment of police officers even though the police budget every year has been increasing so for those who've been talking about oh the defund the police the reason why crime is bad is because y'all defunded ain't nobody been defunding the police in philadelphia the police budget has been increasing each year it hasn't decreased all this whole defund shit all that was political talking points. The police department budget has been increasing. They got a raise this year. They got a raise last year. They've been consi consistently getting an increase in their budgeting. And the argument was, was that, oh, we have to increase the police budget so that the police can be able to fight crime and blah, 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 blah. Well, the funny part is that throughout each year, the police number of police officers have been decreasing in size. And I'm going to get to why that's been happening. But, like, let's, let's, let's acknowledge this. 
budget increasing, but but officers in the department ain't decreasing. I'm I'm confused. Where's the money going? Where's the money going for recruitment? Where's the money going to actually, you know, I don't know, make the case for policing? Because this is not making the case for policing. Actually, it's actually furthering the argument that I've been making that the police department as an institution is a cesspool of money and resources without accountability. Well, this report proves that. Now I have data. Now I know it can be out here gaslighting your face saying, well... You know, Ernest, you know, da da da. Oh, no, 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 no. Au contraire, my dear. The, the data is here. I want to talk to all of them. I want to talk to all the departments. I, it's time to talk to city council members. But here's, here's, here's some other things before I get, because there's a lot to unpack here. And I really wanted to, to use this. This podcast is, a, is an outlet for me to actually take the time to unpack this report because, you know, the headlines in the news, every you know, your daily news, you get all these little highlights about details and stuff and you see, you shake your head. No, no, we're going to un unpack a lot of this because a lot of your, you know, pro-police people, you know, some of them are state reps out here talking all this dumb shit, right? They don't actually take the time to read these things because some of them, you know, let, me, let me be respectful. So here, here we go with this. So we, we've already gotten the, spade, the page of the, the police budget is nearly $800 million. It's close to a billion. It's getting increased every year. Police staffing has been decreasing. And even with the numbers we currently have, okay, as recent as this fiscal year, less than 50% of them are on the streets. Now... Here are the other group. The other group is, like I said, doing jobs that don't need to be done within the police department, which we understand that part. But then there's a large number of officers who are also a part of what is called IOD, injured on duty. And there are a lot of officers who are IOD, injured on duty. And the crazy part about that is that when it comes to heart and lung um, reports, there has been questionable behavior within their internal process that people are arguing that some of these officers are potentially committing fraud based on the lack of investigation of all of this money and all of this 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 paid time off that there is no internal process that's scrutinizing these officers who are taking this quote-unquote time off due to injuries and it looks like there's been an abuse of the system in the hundreds of millions oh yes so the remaining 3,500 are either doing jobs that, that are not necessarily a part of the police department or they're off duty because they're in, they were allegedly injured on duty. And I'm not saying, I don't even have to put the fucking all off, not all officers. Of course, there are some officers that are legitimately injured that are not on. But they're apparently, based on research and reports and investigation, there is questionable behavior happening in this department where all these officers are just taking off getting paid leave all their benefits there's no scrutiny or medical collection of data to actually confirm how these officers are injured and how long they should be off the force it's just clocking out and clocking in there is no accountability whatsoever now because i'm about to build this up i'm going somewhere with this the other aspect is let's get into the service shall we so let's talk about the 25 Hundred officers that are actually on patrol, that are actually quote unquote supposed to be fighting the crime. They also reported in this report that less than half of the force actually on the ground, right? It's been even more disappointing to find out that police are twice as fast to respond to crime in white communities than those of color. Yes. Now, gag some more on this. You heard that correctly. Police, right? The police, all right? Philadelphia police are twice as fast to respond to crime in white communities than they are of those of color. Now, let's also talk about why this would also be infuriating. There are about an average of 11 officers in high crime areas, around 11, compared to those that are not high crime, about six. So... Even with nearly twice as many officers in high crime areas that are oftentimes predominantly black areas, they're getting, with twice as much officers in white neighborhoods, they're getting less than half, less than, 
basically they're less than twice as likely to get a response from the police from 911 calls. And they collected this information from 911 response calls in zip codes and areas. So you're less you're you're less than twice as less likely to get police to call you as fast compared to white neighborhoods with less officers than you. Wow. So even when you put more officers in black communities, right? High crime areas, twice as many as white neighborhoods. The service is actually twice as worse. Which lets you all know the pattern here, right? The pattern is, is that racial bias permeates through services. That even when you put more officers on a job or area, you're still going to see racial disparities. Because the majority of police officers in Philadelphia are majority white. And a lot of them don't actually live in the area. They're, they try to push this narrative of trying to put more cops in the area. But it's like, mm, so telling, so telling. But the worst thing, and this is the part that that I want to actually, you know, bring this all full circle, is that at this point, a lot of you all might be saying, well, what about the mayor? What about city council? What have they been doing? Why has this been happening for years? Well, during the report, city council admitted that they, quote, have little insight into how PPD, Philadelphia Police Department, is spending its funds. So let me get this straight. The Philadelphia Police Department, which is the largest single-funded institution department in our city, most of our taxpayers' dollars go to the Philadelphia Police Department and any other singular department in the city. And you mean to tell me that the city, right, city council, our mayor, who gives them the lion's share of our taxpayer money compared to other departments like Parks and Rec, libraries, arts, culture, that they do not know how they are spending our money. That should make every Philadelphian angry. That our city council, who consistently parrot these fucked up political stances on more police and all this, that, and the third. You mean to tell me that y'all don't even know how they're using this money? I mean, obviously they don't know because look how they're using the money. They don't even know. And I say this as an angry Philadelphian, as a taxpayer, as somebody who works in nonprofit, that let's put all of our politics aside. Let's try. And just talk about this on a very fiscal responsible level. You mean to tell me that ev- that every other department in this city gets scrutinized, right? They got to provide budgets, annual reports, summaries, breakdowns. These people, if you ever go into a budget hearing, which many of y'all probably have it because you're too busy working hard. If you go to a city council budget hearing and you sit there, You'll see people come through, nonprofits, other organizations, and they have to show you every expense. They get interrogated. These city council people come up in there with their har, asking all these questions about how they spend their money and their resources and all this shit. They do all of that. And you mean to tell me they do all that to fight to get money, to keep the budget they get, hopefully save money, not lose money, fight. They have to fight and script and scramble and scrape to try to keep whatever money they have. And you mean to tell me that all these departments, as small as they are, and they're fighting for a couple of thousands, that this institution that has hundreds of millions of dollars, you don't can't even tell me what they're doing with it. Fighting crime. Vague. Vague recruitment. What the fuck recruitment means? There's no, there's no real standard. Every single member of city council ought to be ashamed of themselves. Ought to be ashamed of themselves that they voted in favor of this budget And allow a chunk, a huge chunk of that budget for policing to go unscrutinized and let it fly each time. The mayor ought to be ashamed of himself and every city council member should have some shame that they have allowed it to happen. I would not be voting in favor of that budget if if, if they allowed for the huge police department budget to go unchecked. I could not support a budget that allowed money like that to be abused. The, the fault and the blood is on all their hands. Because the reality is, I'm going to play this with them, the logic 
And these are talking points that I want some of you all to tell your friends in city council, in the state office, in these offices, that you all sit up here and make this argument about, oh, police, we need police. Okay, you, you want to act like y'all need police so bad. Ooh, we need them. They're going to fight the gun violence issue. Okay, if you believe that. I don't, but let's say you believe that. Well, how do you feel knowing that you're not maximizing the dollars or holding the institution to do this work accountable? So much of the energy is on black communities. Like they're asking neighborhoods, you know, speak up, say something. Well, guess what? Based on according to your rules, if we were to call and report the crime or to report it, you guys are, are going to be there twice half as last, as fast, not as fast. You're too busy addressing little crimes in Rittenhouse to actually care about what's happening in Northwest Philly or Southwest Philly or anywhere else. You don't care. Your, your response rate is piss poor. You wouldn't even be able to solve the crime that fast. That's how sucky you all are at responding to issues in high crime areas or black areas, actually, right? So you're not even doing the job that you're assigned to do. You're failing at the assignment. Because people probably in their mind thought that with that much money, we had lots of police and they're out here and they're driving and arresting people. Like if you think the carceral state is the answer, okay. But even as believing in that system, the system is flawed as fuck in its current operation. Even with all the money they're given every year, even with all of the attention and priority and the lack of red tape on what they can spend their money on, they still suck. And the crazy part is, is that everybody just keeps thinking, give more money to them. Sherelle Parker proposed, you know, she's now a mayoral candidate. She put out a platform talking about, some, we need more officers, 300 new officers. Are you dumb? Are you stupid? What kind of plan is that? You want to increase the number of police officers with a budget, right? Which means you're going to take out more money from public resources, right? So, because you know the pie does not increase in Philadelphia. It reallocates. So in your mind, right, your, your, your mindset is that, Knowing what our budget is, where do you plan to get this additional money? Who Who's going to be the sacrificial lamb? Arts, parks and recs, public school support, infrastructure, because these fucking potholes are everywhere. Where's the structure? What budget are you going to take this money from to give them more money to do what with it? 300 more. What about the ones currently there? Get their asses off of the computer desk and put them back in the patrol if that's your logic for policing. I mean, if you're going to go that route, I mean, at least I'll play not devil's advocate, but I'll just argue that what you want, you're not even achieving it. <laughs> like the whole idea of increasing public safety. What? No, you've already increased public funding. I mean, are they scared to go out in the streets? Are they scared to do their job? I mean, are do they are they too not in favor of police? Are all of these 35? I mean, it's clear to me they're anti-policing as well. 3,500 officers either out of duty or doing something that's not patrolling the streets. So everybody don't want to be out here. I mean, I could put that money to better use. I can tell you what to do eight hundred million dollars. Listen, if you cut some of that money from the police budget, since they don't know what to do with it, I mean, they're not. I mean, it's wasting money. I know a bunch of different people out here who got some crazy, dope ideas to beautify the city. I know some organizations out here who got hell of money that want to put money into programs and create grants to keep kids off the street, after school programs. Enrichment programs, more more arts and culture in public schools. There's a lot of other great resources, more public assistance for those who are struggling from homelessness and home insecurity. I mean, there's so many other things that we could be using the money for and would actually do more to actually decrease crime in Philadelphia than throwing money into the police department, which isn't doing anything to fight crime in Philadelphia. And then also they're just using the money to take off like I mean, so you mean to tell me that in this city, it is easy for someone to become an officer, get a super dope above average salary coming in. I, I ain't gonna hold you. Police salaries starting with no college degree or anything is, is, is putting a lot of people's jobs to shame. But then again, it's because it's a workforce. I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna tell you something. Here's my conspiracy theory, or maybe it's not even a conspiracy theory. I, I do think that there is a buy-in interest of the police department. It is one of the few institutions in America right now that does not require um, some formal education in order to be successful. Um, you don't have to have a college degree 
to be successful. It's one of the, you know, labor is, you know, labor has its its things right there. So we have the construction workers and labor, right? That's 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 also there. But labor, like I see, like Philadelphia, where we have a, a low literacy rate in Philadelphia, we also have a very smaller degree acquisition percentage in the city. A lot of people in the city are Ill- are illiterate adults. Adult illiteracy is very big here in Philly, which also speaks to education levels, right? And so technically a lot of the jobs there's a fight in this city right now. Our economy's in a fight. There's a fight for non-degree jobs that are paying decent salaries or or more, right? That job market is shrinking. Technology is eating up a lot of those jobs. And also the economy is shifting in a way. And so in a city like Philadelphia, where you have a huge uneducated population, high illiteracy rates, lack of capital to support small businesses that are of color, it is a lot of of the line, a lot of these old school, old guard institutions, like the construction and building and trades, and like the police department and some of the other departments, fire departments other, and others, they provide a strong workforce base in our city. And the reality is, I think part of the reason why city council keeps the police department with so much money is because they're trying to keep a demographic of this city employed and also, you know, Em, you know, employed because if you take out, if you reduce the money of the Philadelphia Police Department, if you reduce funding in, in, in different arenas on prioritizing those types of jobs, then a lot of people who don't have a degree, who did not do formal education, would, 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 would be unemployed and they wouldn't know where to put those individuals, what department that those, they can move those people to. And so institutions like the police department, in my mind, this is my theory, and I know there's probably some author, some 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 researcher who probably have already done this work. I, I have not read on it, but there might be someone out there. I will not doubt. This is not something I invented. It, it must be something out there. And by all means, sharing is caring, educating is important. But where I stand on this is that I look at the police department politically as a major workforce to this city. And that is why people want to keep them afloat because it's not about actually them effectively cutting crime. But when you look at the FOP, right, the Fraternal Order of Police in this union, it's really an argument about jobs and employment. It's not really a conversation about effectiveness on the job because I think we can all agree that research has shown us that they have not been effective in solving crime. So then why are they here? Why do we still have to, why are people still divided on it? Because they have jobs that no one else would have a job for them. This city has not modernized itself and has diversified itself enough to create other alternative jobs for all of these people that are here. And even the city, right? Even Philadelphia city jobs, our city government as a bureaucracy has so much funding and so much money. So many people are working for the city that is ridiculous. And you would think that for all the city jobs we got, that we will be more efficient. We're not. <laughs> these departments, some of these departments suck. Some of them suck. I'll give you a department that sucks or, or, or initiative. I mean, how many departments this mayor has, right? The Office of Gun Violence Prevention, right? Th- that, that whole department has people in there with six-figure salaries. Most of people up in there got six-figure salaries over there in an office of, of gun violence prevention. It's this task force, this initiative that Kenny put up. Well, where's the results? They didn't even at one point understood data. They wasn't even collecting accurate data to measure the effectiveness of all of these initiatives that they put out there. But you know what? I was very hard on them about that, and I was saying that, that we should dismantle that department, and we should dismantle it, Right. But here's what I thought about is that, well, if there's not any real accountability happening in the Philadelphia Police Department, how could I expect a department like that to also be given 
a level of scrutiny or expectation. It's funny because everybody wants to, like, like everybody wants to hold all these other programs accountable, which they should, but nobody's actually even looking at the police department yet. That's why this audit by city controller Rebecca Reinhart has been very, you know, just a, just a godsend because so many of the conversations and arguments I've had with um, different people on both sides of this, 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 this topic, it was always people acting like, oh, that's not true. Or we don't know. Now we know. And so every city council member that is currently in office and this mayor, when we get to the budget hearings in next spring, okay, and I know there'll be midterms and other politics, if the budget goes through without any level of scrutiny, I'm telling you right now, it's going to be hell to pay. And I'm going to tell you this much. I'm going to actually, all of these city council members that are running for re-election, I will make it a point as a journalist and, and, and doing my job. I'm asking every single one of them, what are you going to do about this police budget with this report? And they better have a solid answer. And if the conversation is on some soft stuff, you're not, you're not getting my vote. You're not. I don't care who you are. Now is not the time to play. There is a real moment right now. We are here. We have data. We have information. We have facts. Lean into the facts. If you let this police rhetoric and all this lawlessness bullshit that we've been hearing for the past several months, if I hear these city council people doing it, I'm calling them a liar on site and I'm telling them the facts and I'm giving them that report and I'm going to and I'm going to ask them to do better. We're, we're past the point of sitting in rooms and letting people lie in front of us. I'm no Noriega, okay? That shit with drink champs, which we'll get to in a minute, we're not sitting around anymore and letting people lie to the public. Not on my watch. I, I refuse to. If I see an elected official in a public space lie about police budgeting and, and, and just simple information that can be verified, I am going to call it out on site and say that is not true. And tell them that straight up. We have to do this. We have to do this. We, you know, I was seeing something on Twitter and someone was saying how a lot of people have underestimated the power of speaking out. But if you recognize, from where I stand as a journalist, there's so many people out here in our country, in our society, that are not speaking out when they need to, that as much as we act like that's not enough, it may not be everything, but you know what? It is something. Because there is a lot of people that are sitting on facts and findings and are not using their voice or their platforms to speak out. It is comfort for them. It is, it is, it is, it is complicit for them to just sit back and just let things happen, knowing better and not saying anything. That's not leadership. That's not ethical. That's not becoming. That's not good. And now that we have the information that we have, I will definitely be confronting future candidates and current electeds on this topic. And really getting to the roots with them and getting to the bottom of it with them. Because we've allowed so much to happen that we can't, we can't, we cannot keep repeating the same shit. We know what we know now. And everybody is going to go back to the status quo. This blood is on their hands. We're never going to address the crime issue in this city if we don't scrutinize the institutions to which we're giving them the money for. And that is a very nonpartisan point. Every institution deserves fiscal scrutiny. And I and I push on this because I think about Alan Dom, who is no longer a city council member, but has not declared himself as a mayoral candidate. And I want to say this, I'm going to say this, and people are going to say, oh, you're throwing shade, but I'm going to state a fact. I am personally over the fact that Alan Dom gets to run around Philadelphia right now and, you know... Talk about he's on this tour, this information tour, to figure out, you know, what Philadelphia thinks about these issues. Stop it. Either you're going to run and you're going to put skin in the game. But remember what I told you all about my predictions. And my predictions have so far been on the money. So far. I said, I think that he's bluffing. I don't think he's going to do it. And I keep telling everyone, I don't think he's going to do it. I think that the more and more... We get closer to May. And I told you all my mind is on November 8th, but I'm having a little moment right now because we could do we could do two things at once on this episode. But I'm focused on November 8th. But I want to say that I get so annoyed by the fact that he continues to make these trips throughout Philly like he was in Kensington. He's doing all these listening tours in these black neighborhoods. All of this stuff. And I'm just like, dude, dude, 
it's the it's the it's the decision scene like when LeBron did the decision and everyone was like, ooh, I, it's giving that and like no one cares, no one cares, no one cares. It's a lot of people already running for mayor. You don't have to be one of them. You could be a very generous, influential white man that uses your money and your and your prestige and your your connections to to move the needle forward in a very more productive, meaningful manner. You do not have to be a part of the cattle call of people that's currently running for mayor, especially when you have nothing to bring to the table and diversity. And yeah, I'm going to say it. I don't think Philadelphia wants to elect another white straight man in this position. They don't want to do it. It's not going to happen. I doubt it. Okay. And that goes for everybody. Listen, I know he's not the only straight white man that's considering winning for, for, for mayor right now, but this city is, 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 I am, I am, I am just, I know the 100th mayor of Philadelphia will be a woman. I just personally feel like it's going to be a woman. I, I just, I just do. It's going to be a woman. Which woman? I don't know. But we're we're getting there. Where by the end of this week, we might have three women running. You know, a white woman, a, a, a black woman is running. A Latinx woman is now she's running. We're gonna have all the diversity. Will an Asian woman run? Will, will Helen get run? We'll see. But it will be a woman. I think a woman. It's it's time for a woman. I don't see. I mean, Derek Green's the only man who's actually announced he's running, um, and he's a black man. And we've had three black men as mayor. Um, you know, we, 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 the first one was a disaster. We'll sing good. The, uh, the second one was street. Not bad. Not bad at all. And the other one's Nutter, which is, you know, depending on who you talk to. But I would tell you, I don't care what y'all say. I would rather have Nutter over Kenny any day. I, I'll say that. I'll say that. I don't care. I don't, I don't like Kenny. I don't think Kenny's done a good job. I would rather have the swagger of a Nutter in office than Kenny. That's just where I stand on. If you don't agree with me, it's fine. But I will tell you that as a black man in Philadelphia, I have never felt so disrespected and felt so just denied in this administration than I felt in my previous years in Philly. Like, I came in during the Nutter era. I came in 2010. And so Nutter was the mayor and he was a pen alum. And I just felt like the Philadelphia I remember and the way that I felt about Philly at that time under his leadership was very different than how I feel now about Philly. Like, I feel like I'm in a situation with Philly now where I was like, like, this is my home. I have to, you know, save it um, because of just how bad things have went under this, this Kenny administration. But yeah, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot on the table. But I know next week's episode is going to be very, very juicy. I have to be very quiet. But there will be some announcements coming out. And let me just start by saying, no, I am not running for city council. I have no plans to. I have no interest to. Uh, someone messaged me um, in my DMs uh, over the weekend and was like saying, oh, you should, you know, I wrote you in to run. And I'm just like, oh, that's nice of you. I have no interest. One, somebody said it best. They said, um, Ernest, I want the salary cut. That's a very, that's a very accurate point. I do not want the salary cut. Um I make more money being who I am than than being a city council member. Uh, not to say that that the only thing that would be the reason why is because of money, but one is because I I think which also another friend had brought up on socials that they think anytime a black person got a voice they should run for office. Very true. No, every black person with a voice does not need to run for office. They should use their voice in their respective industries. I'm in the media journalism industry. I'm going to use my voice there because there is a lack of representation and leaders like myself in that industry. So I need to be there holding the fort. If I run into the cesspool of politics, then what happens to the other leaders in these spaces, right? We all need to be having leaders and representatives from every industry representing. I think we always take someone from one place and want to put them somewhere else. We need to diversify leadership so that when a person runs for office, someone like me that's on the media side, you know, can be able to, they can know they'll get a fair shake, right? They'll get fair coverage. It won't be a Tucker Carlson situation, right? They need, we need to have people like that. And I think sometimes we, every time we see a black person that's articulate, 
in parentheses, or just inspiring. Run for office. No. Sometimes you need them to be where they are, shaking the table. And it means that the people we currently have in office need to step up, but we need education leaders, journalism leaders, culinary leaders, small business leaders, uh, you know, uh, arts leaders. We need people from all these different spaces to lead in the health. Like Dr. Like Dr. Ayla Stanford, right? Like, what she's doing in, in her role is powerful. Like, someone like her, could she run for city council at large? Hell yeah, and she could kick ass. But we don't need to lose our doctors. Like, that's why Dr. Oz, I don't even know if he was a good doctor. I don't even think he was a good doctor. But, like, Dr. Oz should have stayed in Hollywood. Now he's trying to get in politics. No, he should have stayed in Hollywood, okay? Or Holly Weird. But that's where he should have been. We we see so many good people always want to aspire to political office, and it's just like, no, we should be in different places. That's just that's just my belief. So, take it for what it's worth. Now, I'm gonna say this about Kanye West. Kanye West, this drink champ situation. There's a lot to be said about him and about what's going on over there. Um, what I will say the most about when it comes to Kanye is that Kanye is, is on the verge of being canceled. I know a lot of people thought that it wasn't possible, but I'm looking at some real strong signs. So, first of all, Balenciaga, the fashion industry, has completely turned on him. Okay? They are over him. They are so over him. He is getting canceled. Okay? So, that's one thing. The, the people are over him. Uh, Balenciaga is the big fashion line that he used to name drop. They've cut ties with him. Anna Wintour and Vogue have cut ties with Kanye West over the anti-Semitism. And I want to say this, because a lot of people have been asking me about reactions and responses and all this around Kanye. Kanye, th there's only two ways to look at the Kanye situation, and I'm going to go look at it this way. And these are only good faith arguments about how to deal with Kanye. Because at this point, Kanye is, is, is doing what he's doing by design. And I have so many theories on this, and I'm going to flesh them out here. So, for starters, I do, I do think Kaya is on the verge of being canceled. I think he has crossed the line. He has found that spot that now is the point of no return, and I think that he will largely be canceled. Um, he's done stuff that is completely indefensible. And the truth of the matter is, you know, I'm going to be a little frank here, but a lot of people have brought up the stuff of saying, like, you know, and I've talked about it too, that, you know, a lot of our conversation has been, like, for white people, you know, you all did not hold him with that same level of accountability when he was saying a lot of anti-black things. And, you know, arguably he should have been canceled for all of the problematic things he said about black women, black people, black history, and everything in between. He's been very anti-black for a while. And, you know, a lot of the frustration of hearing white people say he's crossed the line and, and they were ready to let him go, you know, some of those people, I, I was frustrated. And I did speak about that, that, like, why did anti-Semitism have to take him being, you know, anti-Semitic for this to finally happen? Well, you know, the truth of the matter is that white people are going to white people and white people going to do what they're always going to do. But you know what I, I, I am going to say in retrospect? And, and 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 adding on to the conversation is that we presumed that there are black people within our community that also should have been canceling him that did not. And that came full circle for me with the situation with Drink Champs. As you all know, Noriega, who's the host of Drink Champs, he is been on this apology tour regretting having Kai on the show. But I, I have no sympathy for him because... This man milked the fuck out that show last weekend when the show came out. Revolt TV has removed it. A lot of other people have since removed the show. So the show, I mean, Revolt TV, which also is, uh, Drink Champs is an affiliate under Revolt TV. They've taken it off of their social media platform. So you can't watch it from them. But the clips are out there. The interview was all over YouTube. There's ways to find it in the deep, deep, deep vessels. But they removed it. 24 hours after they got all the traffic and all the buzz and attention and after Nori was claiming he owned the internet and was bragging about himself and gassing this all up. Okay, so so they they got what they wanted out of it. They wanted the moment. They wanted it in the worst ways. You brought an anti-Semitic, anti-black dude, got up there, tried to talk about George Floyd didn't die from the police, even though the man in question who killed and murdered him got convicted and is now serving time behind bars. But we're sitting around here irritating this idea he's he's letting noriega's letting this man do this noriega is not a journalist that that's not even journalism Let, let's stop conflating 
this. This is not journalism. Okay. It's not at all. Like it's not even for the slightest. And I think that's the problem is that we're too busy trying to allow every person to be an expert at something. We need to bring smart back again. I've been saying this, but I really mean it. We need to start telling people what they are and what they aren't and calling a thing a thing, a spade a spade when it comes to professional work, right? Like too many people get away with using titles. I mean, you got fucking, you know, Herschel Walker out here acting like he's a real officer because he was given some honorary badge. Like this is this is the shit I'm talking about. Like everything's up for debate now. No, it's not. When it comes to professional shit, right? Noriega's not a journalist, and it's not journalism what he's doing. You think that because you got a mic that somehow you're a journalist? No. You think that because you have some type of media platform that all of a sudden you're, you're a journalist? If you don't get the get 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 the if you don't get your shit together, I'm just over it, over it, over it. Period. Just put that in full perspective. I'm completely over it. But I say all this to say that. We've seen a lot of people, you know, in our in our industry take advantage um of of so much. You know what I'm saying? We we've seen people um take advantage of innocent people and their ideas and who they are and 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 some of those politics that we've seen for a while we we haven't you know said anything about them we we've just let people say it's a difference of opinion but we're past that point of difference of opinion um personally i i don't i don't see these things as difference of opinion anymore you know it's very self explanatory what they are and what they what they're about and so with with noriega and and drink champs he said he was all providing a platform for people to share different opinions we we got to be clear in my book, the case for council culture. Of course, I, I talk about this 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 realm around different opinions and differences and and hate speech and these things and this fear about council culture. I don't want to give out too much of the book because I do want people to take the time to read everything and in, in, in the logical argument, the placement in which I make these points. What I want to be clear about here, and what I will say on this podcast about it is that the First Amendment around free speech did not protect all speech. And let's also be clear that those that, that constitutional right to free speech, when people talk about that, that you know, it protects people from being canceled, it's a free country, free speech. Let's be very clear. It protected you from the law. It protected you from not being arrested and persecuted legally um, by the police system. So there's no law. You cannot get arrested for having certain views. Now, hate speech is if you say threatening speech, right? You can you can be arrested if you say, you know, you threaten to to cause physical harm, right? Because that's not protected. But bigotry, right? Saying the N-word, saying anti-Semitic things, no, you cannot get arrested. There is free speech protections on hate speech in that realm, okay? If it's non-threatening speech, um, when it comes to physicalness. However, Everybody also has a right to free opinions and views and opinions that allows them to either affirm or not affirm beliefs. And they can create that based on their own levels of discriminatory. So that's when the line of anti-discrimination comes in. For the, the First Amendment protected people from arrest, right, to actual arrest. And in some cases, you can be sued, right, in certain cases. But it protected you from being arrested, like criminally charged, um, directly, okay? So if I say something racist, uh, the police will not come to my door. You cannot call the police and I cannot be arrested. It's not a criminal uh, punishment for that, right? That's what people don't get. That's what the First Amendment protected you from. And it not protect you from the court of public opinion. That as you have your own opinions about something that's problematic, you also face other forms in this free speech conversation. So if you have the right to say something racist, I have the right to say something anti-racist. I have the right in this free market, in this free enterprise, that I can choose who to hire, who to fire based on certain sets of principles that are also protected by law. So in this country, people have the right, companies, commercial independent companies have the right to fire you or create codes of conduct and policies around discrimination if they align with the free 
practice ordinances or the fair practice ordinances of their municipalities. There are different laws and rules around discrimination that are passed into laws. And those changes, right, along that are the consequences that come from you have other consequences that might be worse than an arrest. So you can say something racist, but a company can also fire you uh, at at will state. You can still get fired for for expressing racist opinions and views. Um, There is, you know, you have a right to, you know, be held accountable. If If you have a partnership, an agreement, where on that contract they had a code of conduct and they had terms and agreements that you agreed to. Y'all, y'all, y'all see what I'm doing here? You had a code of conduct and it was an agreement that you're supposed to make and you basically did not agree with it or you did something different. You too could also be subjected to liability and losing of a job. And contracts and partnerships have codes of conduct and standards. And if you, if you violate those standards and those contracts, then you could, you could lose your job based on that. So you're not canceled you know, in the sense of you, you, you're, you're acting like you're canceled. I mean, those cancellations are rightfully so. And so a lot of people say these terms like, oh, I got canceled. But let's see, I got several ties. Okay, that's a choice they made because of their beliefs. And that cancellation was justified. There was no breach of your free speech. Because at the end of the day, you say what you wanted. I think we live in a world where people think that free speech don't mean consequences. No, 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 no. Free speech never protects you from consequences, good or bad, because there's good consequences that can happen, right? But there's also bad consequences. Free speech protects you from being criminalized for your for your speech, and it protects you from every other aspect. And so we we see this happen all the time. And also, for all my free speech advocates, it's so funny that the Noriegas of the world and these people that talk about free speech, free speech, why is it that we're always defending free speech when it's committing harm towards minorities or marginalized people? How come the free speech argument is only used to protect people from doing offensive, harmful things? How come we're not actually protecting free speech that, that is actually seeking to do good, right? I didn't see too many free speech advocates come in and defend and support Colin Kaepernick for taking a knee. I didn't I didn't see so many free speech advocates coming out to support these black queer authors and these anti-racist authors who are putting out books about queer people, intersectionality, diversity, and calling out racism. When those book bannings happen at these libraries, where are y'all at talking about the free speech? How come the free speech argument is always used to protect people from having opinions that are anti-Semitic, anti-black women, misogynistic, misogynoir, and every form of Islamophobia, anti-Semitism on the planet? You all are okay with trying to defend that argument of saying offensive things. Why? Because it's about power. But you have to read that in the book. So read the book, The Case for Council Culture. Pre-order it because I talk more about this. But I just want to put that, that out there that it's so funny that the free speech argument is always used to defend people misbehaving badly or saying offensive things that is 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 is, is not okay. But all of a sudden... We're not defending and protecting, you know, people who are saying progressive views. That are saying stuff that's actually going to enlighten people. There are people out here writing books. They try to take a book away that was about Michelle Obama and black excellence. They want to try to ban that book in the store. I don't see people out here that are the same, the same folks. Let me be clear. The same advocates that are trying to defend Kanye's right to free speech as if his free speech has been taken away. I'm sorry, you don't get the go. That's how, see, the, the irony of capitalism is that capitalism allows people power and resources that Kanye gets a platform because he's rich, right? He gets access to say all this stuff because he's rich. Because if he was a poor black man in this country that wanted to rant and rave and say all types of shit that we don't like, he would never be put on a platform to spew that kind of stuff and be also given this, this larger-than-life defense of, of 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 that that that's capitalism protecting him however that same capitalism on the other sword also gets the power to pick and choose who they want and who they don't want and so these big multi-billion dollar brands and these companies that are cutting ties from kanye you all are calling it cancel but this is the same institution that platforms him so if they can't put him up and put him down at their choice then you're against free markets so that's a very anti-capitalist ideal Or is it anti-democratic? Which one is it? Because aren't they allowed to have a choice and who they want to represent their brands? And so you're calling it cancelizing or you're defending. So is it really about free speech or you're just defending white supremacy? (gasps) 
Shocker. More in that book. I'm telling you, to me, this is not about free speech. It's about protecting white supremacy. The arguments for protecting Kanye West is not about protecting free speech. It's about protecting white supremacy. It's about, it's about protecting it. And to be very clear, in white supremacy is anti-Semitism, is, is anti-Blackness, is colorism, is racism, is homophobia, is transphobia. These are all entities. Islamophobia. All of this are entities of white supremacy. And as you can see, there is a correlation between those who hold anti black ideals alongside anti-Semitic ideals and also very sexist homophobic ideals. Kanye went on Pierce Morgan and, you know, Pierce has become the new guy who wants to act like, you know, I was canceled. So, you know, notice that all these people that, that are canceled go far right. And then they want to attack the left or attack progressives. Notice that they don't, they don't, they, they, they become super conservative and align themselves with white supremacists and, and platforms that support anti-Semitism. Is that interesting? Oh no, because they're not here about free speech. They're here about supporting white supremacy and all of them are agents of white supremacy and they're very harmful ways. So they're trying to protect the institutions and they're trying to save the guard and old guard of this type of problematic behavior. Like that's why they all go that way. Think about one person. The only person who did not do that well, she wasn't even involved. Let me let me let me go here. Sharon Osbourne, for example, right? She was on that show, The Real or The Talk. I think it was called The Talk. I never really watched it. But when she was out here saying racially offensive stuff on that show, and they decided to let go of her because it came out that she was doing a lot of other accused problematic things, right? She is now on Fox Nation with a show called Hell and Back. So all that talk about being canceled, and now she's got a show on Fox Nation. That's, of course, connected with Fox News. So, you know, all that much. Now you got your own show, girl. Now you got your platform. And your good homie, Pierce Morgan, who you're defending. Look at Pierce. Pierce got his own little show now. And, and y'all are letting people like Kanye in your show. So Kanye was on that show and basically says that he can resonate with straight white men. Because of his power. Oh, he's told no lies, baby. Say the quiet part out loud. What Kanye was trying to tell us is is that he feels more connected with white straight men because of his power, that he believes that his power is wealth. He has been able to buy whiteness. He's been able to now, because of his capital, his access to capital, that now he believes that he is more in solidarity and connection with white straight men who he claims does not have a platform, who he claims does not have a voice because, you know, they're white straight men and that, oh my God, they don't take up most of the literary industry. They don't take up most of the media jobs and journalism. Oh, that they so happen not to take up most of the professorships and corporate CEO positions. They don't have a voice. Oh, white, white people, white straight men don't have a voice in America. Oh, my God. They, they don't own all the companies and have all the money and access to capital. Oh, my goodness. Oh, those poor minorities they are. Yeah, that's what Kanye believes. That's what Kanye has been out here preaching. He's been out here defending the mediocrity of straight white man and really trying to put out and act like he's a voice and an ally to them because that's what they need. They need an ally like Kanye West, right? He, they need an ally like him because, you know, look, 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 look what we would be without him. Like if we didn't have Kanye right now defending white straight men and their need to have a voice, the world would just be in shambles. I mean, what would we do without Kanye and his shucking and jiving? Oh my goodness. Let's take a moment to reflect on that. Like, what would that look like? Clearly not much. Clearly not much. I mean, is there any white man in America who really feels like, you know, they don't have a platform now? So they really feel like because of the way society is, that they're not being heard. Like we didn't hear them in 2016. I mean, every, every, <laughs> first of all, there's enough people defending white men, like white women in society. And so in many ways, Kanye's behavior is almost identical to that of white women, you know? Um, some white women who are voting, right? They That they think that somehow coming and aiding white men will be a part of their advancement in society. I mean, that's how you got Trump, right? The majority of white women in America did not vote for another white woman in Hillary Clinton. They voted for 
they voted for Trump. Um, and, and a lot of them made those decisions because they felt like, th- I mean, there was clearly internalized sexism there, but also I think their opinions is that there's, there's this whole argument of, I'm thinking about my son, my son, my son, they thinking about their white male sons, but no one's talking about their daughters and what Roe v. Wade being taken away will mean for them and others, because this is a patriarchal system. And so Kanye is invested in that. And a lot of these people, the Noriegas and all these men, The truth of the matter is that they believe that their access to wealth has now made them targets in their own community. They don't even trust their own community. They don't even trust other Black people. They really believe that their wealth in society has put them in a position where they're the anti-hero. And so now they have to, you know, wrestle with how, how, how they can maintain what they've worked so hard for while also trying to you know, I guess appeal to the to, to this community that they still want to belong to. It's a very interesting, fucked up way of thinking, but this is what happens when you when you when you when you live in a society that values rich people's opinions above everyone else's. When you live in a society that measures intelligence and whatever the word genius is to this day with money. Right. You know, this term genius was never decolonized and unpacked. And now genius is rich people. Genius is people who have the most access to resources and and capital. And they get to be called geniuses because somehow we think it's genius that they probably have exploited their way to the top without any accountability. And now we aspire to that. And so... You want to know why Noriega brought Kanye? Because Kanye, you know, he's a fan of Kanye. But people are are supposed to, you know, respect him and and acknowledge him because of what? We we don't talk about how people get their money and what people are doing with their money. I mean, look what he's just recently done. He's invested a large share of his money to now uh, Parler, which is that really problematic app that's like really not around. But he's investing his money. And this in in Parler, which is this problematic far right um, app, social media app, because you know he's no longer on Instagram and Twitter anymore, thank goodness. But now he is putting his money there. Well, as you all know by now or don't know, Candace Owens's husband is the CEO of that tech company. So basically, the money and the, and the investment is there. He is going full, full, total mega. He's been going mega for years, but 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 he's 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 created this for himself, right? And so here's here's where here, here's where my frustrations lie. I don't want to hear anyone talk about Kanye and mental health and try to act like they empathize with him or sympathize with him for it. If you believe there's two ways to go about this, and this is what I was bringing up earlier, this is my ultimatum with this. If you believe that Kanye is dealing with a lot of mental distress and, you know, mental health issues and all of that, and you're worried about him, then you would believe that he needs to be deplatformed and basically, you know, left alone and out of the public spotlight. Because you would believe that if you believe that he is really having a serious episode and it's not good for his health and you're really worried about it, then you would agree that he should not be on any media right now. Anyone interviewing Kanye and putting him on their platforms are asking for, are exploiting him. They're exploiting him. They're exploiting his condition. They're using it as an opportunity for ratings. They don't care about him or his actual health. Okay? So he needs to be canceled. Um... On that front, he needs to go away. He needs to not be on social. He does not need to be doing any interviews right now. He needs to be prioritizing his health and his wellness. And and he needs to be doing that. And that means that we don't need any more music from him. We don't need any more clothes. We don't need any more shit from him. He needs to go away. And he needs to prioritize his health. If that's the argument, if if you believe that that is what it is with him, right? And everybody wants to keep doing that, making that argument. And you want to claim it's a good faith argument then he needs to go away then. Because what you can't do is the, oh, this is mental health, is that. Okay, if that's that reason. Do you think that this environment that he's under right now and this microscope and this scrutiny is good for his health? It's not. 
It's not good for anyone's health. This type of attention, this type of visibility, it's not good for anybody. And it's definitely not good for him. So anybody in their right mind that's on this side of the argument should not encourage him to do any more interviews, should not be supporting any more projects for him. All this coverage he's getting, a ye universe, or ecosystem, whatever this shit, all this is garbage. We don't need any more of that. So we need to put that away. Put that away. Okay. So now we put that away. We're moving on away. Shush that away. Now, let's now focus and get back to the other shit that's at stake at bay here. So now we're going to the new part. And the new part is... He's an agent of white supremacy. I believe that Kanye knows what he's doing. There might be some other mental health issues at play, but I don't think we should, personally, my other argument is that we should conflate mental health with this stuff, okay? Mental health issues don't turn you into a white supremacist overnight. You know, you are delegitimizing the actual real health issues and disabilities that other people are facing. And to conflate mental health with an obsession with white supremacy, I think that's the wrong way to go about it. I've heard people try to claim Stockholm Syndrome and all this shit. Stop it. Stop it. You don't know what these terms mean. You don't know what, what any of this is. He's not being held captive. Okay? He's making an active decision. I know it's hard for some of you all to believe that your favorite artist has completely decided to be something else. But guess what? That's called human nature. You do not know this person. You have not friends with this person. You've connected with them over music and art. That's beautiful. That's great. But at the end of the day, this is a grown-ass man who's made some grown-ass decisions. He needs to be held accountable for it. So where I stand with it is, regardless of whatever the other circumstances is, he is causing ridiculous harm. And it's not good for anybody. And it's not good for himself. And I'm not prioritizing his wellness in this. I prioritize that of victims, of my community, of black women, other people who have fallen victim to un on unnecessary online attacks and threats for speaking out and calling him in. So he's been called in. He's now being called out. I think he needs to go away. And I don't care where he goes, but he needs to be deplatformed. He needs to be canceled because either way you fl flip it, we should all be able to agree that what he's currently doing, this can't keep going. This is not funny. It's not yay being yay. It's not It's not a yay rant. Everybody likes to, does the problem. You all have tried to normalize this behavior. And now it's gotten to the point that you all have basically fed a monster that is out of control. Stop blaming his mother. Stop blaming his exes. Stop blaming black women for why this has happened. Stop trying to use other people to justify this. We have, there it is so insensitive. I have lost a family member. I've lost people in my life and it didn't make me go into this realm. You, you, you know, the way that we, the, you know, there was a statement that people said, people don't like what is brought up, but like that basically black straight men are the white men of our community because they're oftentimes hold power, right? In our community, in our patriarch, they do hold power, okay? And for different reasons, society let, lets them... While we live in a white supremacist society that targets black men, which is which is accurate, within our community, when we're talking about in intersectionality, in a space where black women are involved, black men hold power in those spaces. Like everybody, regardless of race, have issues they could work on. Sometimes I think we conflate the racial oppression that happens to black men and that is oftentimes used to dismiss misogynoir, colorism, abuse, sexism, homophobia, transphobia within our community. It's almost like there's a past. Like if it you know because we know how policing and racism has impacted black men specifically black straight men in society, what happens is that when they are homophobic, when they do other problematic things, in our community, they're given a level of a pass because we're under the guise that all of those things can justify those things. It does not. Because there are black cishet men who are not, you know, cloaked in misogynoir or, um, you know, homophobia or transphobia aggressively. They're not into that. And the sad part is that because there's been so much of these poor conflations allowing black cis het men to be justified in their homophobia, in their transphobia, in their sexism due to the white supremacy that they face and encounter, 
what we do is we ignore and deny black queer people, black women, those same experiences. We don't give them the same level of grace because let's be real here. B- black women and black queer people are also experiencing white supremacy, sexism, and other issues as well. And that gets ignored in the conversation because so much energy, because of the patriarchal system the society we live in, is focused on black straight men's priorities. And we ex- we deny our other lived experiences and our identities. I don't do that. I stopped doing that for a long time. Um, when I was in spaces, when it was Black Lives Matter, we saw a lot of the movement focus on specifically black cishet men who were being you know, unlawfully or extrajudicially killed by police. And then Say Her Name had to be born. And what was interesting about Say Her Name and and the fact is that Black Lives Matter was formulated, created by Black women. Some were queer, some were were not, but it was formed by Black women, mostly Black queer women, who stand at all of those margins. And yet the movement oftentimes prioritized initially the, the harm that was being done to Black straight men. And yet even within that movement and the movement and the work and these conversations about Black Lives Matter and supporting this is that these same, some of these same cishet Black men who are in this space and they talk about racial injustice will continue to deny protection for Black women and Black queer people. Even though it was us who've been keeping the mantle going and keeping the movement work going. And yet we're always still being tossed aside in work that we have invited them to be a part of, that we have put them in and prioritized and elevated. It's just kind of like, what are we doing here? And so with Kanye, I think about how Chrisette Michelle, and I talk about this in my book, it was quick, right? Stacey Dash, quick. Candace Owens, quick. Kanye West, oh, tons of excuses, tons of of, of things. You know, all these explanations, all these, all the justification. And there's a gender bias there. There's a gender bias there. And in the larger sphere of society, right? Because Black people are never allowed to not have these conversations about the white gays. We see the same issues that when Kanye is the target of racial bias and how he's being scrutinized and the larger subtext, we are oftentimes neglecting and ignoring the harm he's done to Black people outside of, of himself, right? The harm to Black women, the harm to Black queer folks, specifically in his rhetoric. And to the Black men, like the Noriegas and others who defend him aggressively and obsessively, we don't get a chance to 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 scrutinize that without being told we're we're against black men or, or 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 of course the blame the black man thing. But it's like when are y'all showing the fuck up as a collective for the rest of us? And I say this because as much as I had a lot of energy to rightfully so to a lot of white people institutions, you know, last week that decided to cut ties with Kanye. I expect so much sometimes from white people to do the right thing, even though they don't often do as a collective in these cases. I always am putting them to this higher standard. But even within our own community, we have so many people who are internalizing their anti-blackness and not doing it themselves. And so I want to be very clear that I'm just as angry and frustrated with those in our own community that continue to let this motherfucker linger. That has continued to keep giving him platforms. I'm 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 spending time frustrated with Tucker Carlson and Fox News, but I'm looking at my own community and the media outlets and the people that continue the shade room to allow this man to say whatever he wants. And and like I'm telling white people to step in because what he's doing is harming all of us. But but our own people, some of our own people, largely black cishet men, are allowing him more and more and more. When the other side is trying to tell everyone to stop platforming him. It's a hypocrisy. And it's frustrating. And it's disgusting. And, and, yeah. Let's do better, black people. Do better. Okay, the free speech argument is whack. It's just whack. And that's just it. Woo, did not know we was going to go there, but we did. Because there's so much there. So much. And so, further further on. Um, so, 
I want to talk a little bit about this. I wrote a very, very, very viral post on Instagram about fine dining culture and about range. And I don't know. I feel like every every year there's some stupid Red Lobster Olive Guard debate. Um, you know, there's that, that low vibrational plate nonsense that happened a couple of weeks ago on Black Twitter. And there's all these kinds of about fine dining and eating. And as a as a certified foodie, I just want to say that the stuff I'm hearing online misses the point about food, food experiences, food culture. And what's missing is that people like are lacking the range. We're lacking the range, people. And and I'm also and I've been wanting to write talk about this critique for a minute, but I've been re I've realized just in food culture, the food industry, as somebody who's going to hundreds of restaurants um over the years and have tried different places, okay, from the highest of heights to the lowest of lowest, I've had it all. One of the things that I've recognized outside of foodie world, okay, outside of my space of being with people who love food and understand food like I do and talk about it, is that most of society the way they talk about food has nothing to do about actual taste or enjoyment or fulfillment. It's based on socioeconomic standings. And I hate that about when people talk about food. Like, they're not judging it based on actual experience. It's it's rooted on projection of socioeconomic status. And there's a lot of people that have a lot of, like, socioeconomic anxiety, which I know in a time during recession is even more... But as a foodie, I want to tell you all that range is the most important aspect to defining, you know, taste and culture in food. Because if you judge everything based on the location and price, I'm here to tell you that that type of level of snobbery in food culture just makes you look stupid and don't have the range. So let me just put you onto some some interesting fun facts and reality about it all. As someone who has gone to different restaurants over the years, I want to just say that how I define my taste and interest in food is about exploring, expanding, and enjoying. Okay? The three E's. It's all about exploring, experimenting, and, and also experimenting, I guess, for easy enjoying. When I make decisions about what I'm going to eat, whether I cook or buy or whatever... Those are the things that will fall into one of those categories, okay? So for tonight, you know, Mr. Johnson made a delicious dinner this Sunday supper. This week, he did filet mignon and lobster tails. He, yeah, he did it up this this time around. As you all saw the Instagram picture, he definitely did it up. It was a, it was a different departure. We, we've done different things, but he decided to do that. Some people say, ooh, that's fancy, right? Yeah, sure, we cooked. It is, it is. That's what we felt like doing today. But here's the interesting thing is that there's also, earlier, this, earlier we made tacos, um, just just random tacos. Friday night, we he experimented with making shredded tacos or whatever. Um, I say all this is because that's what Rage gives. Last week... I had made, um, I had a, I made a bacon, egg, and cheese, like, type of breakfast sandwich at home. I went to Popeye's for lunch and had the $6 box. Oh, my goodness. The $6 box is back. If you don't know about this, y'all get on it. You get two pieces of chicken, whatever one you want. You can have uh, thighs or wings, or you can have drumsticks, whatever you want. You can pick whatever two pieces you want, and you get two side dishes and a biscuit for 6 bucks. It's the best damn deal ever. Um, I had that for lunch, and then I did that night, I had Alpen Rose, which was phenomenal. Of course, we had filet mignon, we had duck, we had... Branzino, it was a fabulous dinner. Very, very fabulous. All of the three meals I just named were fabulous. Everything I ate was good. It did what it needed to do. Range is that way. I think if you're somebody who defines good eating or fine dining as a situation where you're only going to whatever this list says you should go and it costs this much money or it's in this part of the ne- neighborhood, then you're doing food the wrong way. Just say that you want people to think that you have more money than you really have or you want people to, to know how much money you think you want them to perceive you have. So that's why you decide to go to that, ter- that, that restaurant. Now, let's be clear. There are some situations where the food is just really that good and it's worth the day. 
damn dime. But I will tell you all that there's a lot of places that I see some people go on social media and they want to flex and they think that it means something. Like, am I supposed to be excited about your taste or I'm supposed to be excited about the fact that you just, you spent a bunch of money somewhere, you know? So I'll give you an example. Oh, I'm about to, oh, I'm about to be controversial, but whatever, what is new? I know a lot of people that like Barclay Prime. Barclay Prime is not a bad restaurant. I think it's just overrated. I thought the steak was okay. I thought it was a nice place. It's pretty. It's nice. Whatever. But it's just like, I, I you could get the same steak somewhere else. I'm not saying at Chili's because no, Chili's does not make that kind of steak. But you could probably get a steak of that magnitude. Maybe Del Frisco's most expensive steak probably is around the same excitement I got at Barclay Prime with what I ordered. You're paying for ambiance, I suppose? Maybe. In some places, sure, right? But I sometimes think people just... I get annoyed with people who just do... Who just lack the range of understanding what these things mean. I'm not saying that every restaurant, there shouldn't be range where, okay, Applebee's. No, you don't go to Applebee's for a steak. So, uh, let me say this about it. It's about comfort and enjoyment. I'll give you an example. So... There are times where I just want to go somewhere and I want to sit down and I want to eat something that just fulfills me and just tastes good. And I just know that there is something about how this tastes that makes me feel good. That's Popeye's. Like, I love Popeye's. Like, I don't go all the time, but there are times where, like, I'm just like, I just want to go in here. I don't want to fuck up this chicken. Because it just needs to be done. I'm com- I, 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 People don't like the Popeye's biscuit. They say different things. The Popeye's biscuit hasn't done any harm to me. But I like it. I, I, I want to have my moment and I want to eat it. And it's good. And if it fulfills what I need, it's comfort. It feels good. There are times when I want to try. I want I want to eat something that is very much so familiar and also not so fussy. But it's a good time. I like to go to Booker's. And sometimes I just want a very standard, like, fun, cozy meal. I don't feel like I need to go to the pomp and circumstance of of a Zahaf. I just want to have something that's convenient and fun that, you know, supports my taste. Then there are times when I want to splurge and I want to explore. And I want to try something that's elevated. I want to try this amazing steak I heard was somewhere. This, 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 this delicious duck breast that I heard is one of a kind and top tier. And so then I want to go to, you know, an Alpen Rose. Or I want to go to, you know, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Because I really want to have this really cool multi-course delight of a dinner. And I've had that. And I love Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's my favorite restaurant in Philly. There's range there, right? Like, every place is not going to be a rented house. Like, one of my favorite brunch places is White Dog Cafe. They have multiple White Dog Cafes, but it's just like, a real, the one in University City is just really fun and cozy. And I just love the cool niche things they do with the food there. Is it one of the, oh my God, you must go there. It's at Attico on a rooftop with beautiful views. No, but that's not the vibe I'm feeling or at that moment. And that food is still good. I think the problem is too many people have been correlating food around price points. No, it's, it's really about, there are places that, that are, that are just really good at what they do. Like I love Indian food and New Delhi. I enjoy New Delhi. I like Vita too. Vita is a great place, but I also like my smaller niche Indian place. There's a place called Taka that is right there in West Philly that just has great Indian food to me. I just love the taste and it's authentic. It's small, but it gets the job done. And I think we've missed that. We've missed that in in just this sense of everyone trying to flex their wealth and their money. And it's like, no, it's it, it's not. That's not fine dining. It's 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 what you make of it. It's it's really about the range of going different places and having different food. Everyone has different food, different things. Like there's some places like, yo, if you want to try to, they got the best steak here, but their chicken, the best chicken is here. Or I love this place for their oysters. And and it's it, that's what matters. And we're losing sight of that. I think we're just losing that as a group. So I don't know. I've I've seen a lot of people out here. They'll, they'll say, oh, yeah, we don't go here. We go here. I'm just like, well, that place isn't that good, but you're just wasting your money there. Congratulations. Like this guy was flexing to me. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, we always go to, you know, bark. I'm like, okay, 
That's the only steakhouse that you think is nice. Why? Because it's a rented house. Ooh, rented house. Yay. And you're talking to a person that goes to all the restaurants. But I will tell you that there, I can find you a better steakhouse than that. That's not that place. Right? I've been places where I'm like, if you want to talk about food quality, this place has better food than here. Just saying. <laughs> like, there's some people out here that's doing like, like, oh my God, like, oh, tradesmen. Everyone likes this barbecue place. I'm like, as a person from the South, that is not the barbecue place I recommend in Philly. There is like, you know, or everyone's like, oh, Fancy Sal. That's okay. They're okay. They're not horrible. But they're better than, than tradesmen. But tradesmen is, in, is in, in Center City, so everybody's like, oh, tradesmen. I, you know, I like that place. Do you like it? Because it's part of a popular chain. I mean, even some of the Asian places that are in Philly, like people, like, everyone loves Shulston Collective. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, Sandpan, Sandpan, Sandpan. Uh, yeah, they're okay. They're tasting me. It's kind of fun. Uh, but there's also Dim Sum House that is, like, in University City. That's also where Jane Jean's at. And I think their shit is so much better. But again, y you know, everyone's driving everything by list. And as a person that advises and help create food lists and advise on them and all that kind of stuff, I just, I, listen, go with what have a range people just have a range if everything you're telling me is uh, is in past junk or in inner center city you don't have the range baby i need to know i i want to hear west philly spots i want to hear north philly northwest philly spots. i want to hear different things okay if you try to have that conversation but you know, this talk about Olive Garden, let me tell you something. I like Olive Garden. Olive Garden has never done anything wrong to me. I enjoy Olive Garden. When Barry and I was first dating very, very early, that was the one place we can we can both eat because he used to be a vegetarian and he used to be very much, he didn't eat certain things. And so Olive Garden was perfect because there was something for everybody at Olive Garden. And Olive Garden's breadsticks and salad, I'm, I'm, it, it hits the spot. It does what it needs to do for me. I, I know a lot of people are like, that's horrible Italian food. I mean, is it is it though? I mean, is it is it bad Italian Maybe it's not authentic Italian food, but I don't. I didn't go to. I, I'm gonna keep 100 with y'all. I don't go to Olive Garden for the sake of like trying to get it to recreate great Italian food. Because if I wanted that, I could go to Vetri. I could go to a lot of other places that are. There's a lot of great Italian places in Philadelphia. Uh, Fogo to not Fogo to Child. What else about um, Georgia on Pine? There's other great places that do Italian food, right? These are great places. That's not one of them, and that's fine. Okay. That's not why I go there. I go there because I just like the food. And I don't necessarily, I'm going for the, for the I just like the, the savoriness of it all. I like the, 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 the quantity. I just enjoy it for what it's giving. It's doing what it needs to do. And if I go to Chili's, am I getting a steak at Chili's? No, y'all. But you know what I like at Chili's that just hits the spot? I love that, that triple dipper, decker thing, the triple power play, whatever that, where you could pick like the Southwestern egg rolls, the boneless, um, the mini burger sliders and then the boneless um, uh, chicken bites or whatever, buffalo wings. And those Southwestern, oh, and that spinach artichoke uh, dip. Oh, so good. But like, it's just good bar food. It's good junk bar food. And if you just want something that's just comforting and just go hit the spot, that's what I have to go to Chili's for. I go to Chili's for that. I'm not going to try to have a serious meal at Chili's personally. It just will not do for me. But listen, I used to love, okay, my little getaway, Jamarcus, I used to go to the, to the Ruby Tuesday Right there in University City. Uh, not University City. In uh, Center City. Right next to um, Liberty Place. And that, listen, that lunch special, we would go there for lunch. And we would go to that little unlimited salad bar. And we would get our life. It, it did what it needed to do. Was I really trying to have a, a, a palate cleansing? No. But every meal isn't supposed to be that way. And that's food. So, moving along. Um... So, Taylor Swift's new album just came out. It's called Midnight's. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love the album. Super excited. She surprised us. Okay, so she started off with like 13 tracks and then gave us seven bonus tracks. So, if you are on any of the app, the streaming music platforms, whatever, go for the 3 a.m. edition of Midnight's, which has 20 songs and 20 songs. No interludes, none of that shit. 20 straight songs. Uh, love the album. I, I, what I like the most about this album is that it's a mature, cohesive, sonically cohesive album. It is an adult pop album, adult alternative energy. I just like that she keeps switching it up. I really appreciate how she will go one direction and then go and do a complete 180. So, you know, her last two 
studio albums were Folklore and Evermore. And both of those went into like a very stripped down, woodsy, bluegrass type of sound. And th then this goes back into synth pop. And it's incredible. It's a whole different mood, a different attitude. I've listened to the album over a, do a dozen times from beginning to end. Definitely some standout songs. Vigilante shit is my shit. Love Vigilante shit. Love Karma. Love Bejeweled. Love Bejeweled. Love Antihero, which is the lead single. It's giving Antihero. The music video just came out. Really creative, really different. Um, really like Antihero. Love the mood of this album. Very, very inward reflecting. Very controlled. Um, just a fun album and just just goes and goes and just so, so... I just feel like every time Taylor Swift drops a new album lately, it matches where I'm at in my life or the vibes or the sounds or the moods. It just fits. Folklore was definitely what took me through the pandemic. But this just is where I'm at now. Like, it's a very post-pandemic album um, or post-lockdown album, I should say, because we're still in the pandemic. But really recommended. Rolling Stones gave it five stars. Don't worry, Beehive. It's not for Grammy con con um, consideration until next year. So for those who was wondering if it was going to shake up the table with the Grammys, upcoming Grammys, no, it will be the following. It, it is past the cutoff date. And I think Taylor Swift did that on purpose, which is good. Um, you know, as far as year of lists, it's my number two album of the year, my number one album of the year so far, and I think we'll continue to hold the title for this year, is Renaissance by Beyonce. Still love that album. It is the it is the best album of the year. Um, but Midnight's is definitely up there. It's the number two best album of the year so far for me. Now, things could change between now and then, but I don't really see any big blockbuster album releases this year. I mean, if Rihanna comes in and drops it on us, maybe, but I think she's going to save everything for next year. I hear Beyonce is going to go on tour. The con the question, she did a, she was at an auction, a wearable art, uh, which she's a big supporter of. She went with, of course, her husband, Jay-Z. And apparently there was uh, Renaissance tickets up for auction and somebody, like I think, got them for $150,000. i am going to tell y'all right now, I don't want to hear nobody with all this wine, all this, all this, oh, I got to save my money up for this concert. Let me tell y'all something right now. Okay? All this, I'm going to save my money up for concert. Let me tell y'all this right now. Some of y'all, some of these people out here who had weddings, okay, and, and some of these people out here who was cheap to their wedding guests, you know, couldn't pay for breakfast and stuff. I, listen, all I'm going to say is that all this, when you telling your friends that you owe money to or telling friends you've been cheap to that you saving money to go to somebody else's concert, don't tell me that. Don't say that around nobody around. Don't say that to people you either owe money to or that you was cheap with because they're going to look at you like, oh, so you you got money to get Beyonce concert tickets, but she didn't have money to buy your friend a gift. For, for their birthday or 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 make sure they was good or or you know could consider you know doing a rehearsal i ain't gonna let me be nice all i'm saying is just be mindful about who you talking about you saving beyonce taking money for when you got a lot of people in your circle that you you didn't have no money for them just just some just some food for thought and i, I don't want to hear it i i, I didn't see some 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 posts and some people making some jokes and i'm just like interesting so you know uncle sam out here looking too I'm not a snitch, but I'm just saying if I was to call Uncle S Uncle Sam and say, "Look, Uncle Sam, you know, you know what? Y'all should put some tracking device on the Beyonce tickets to figure out, you know, if these people owe taxes. You you gotta be up to date on your taxes or about Beyonce concert ticket. Well, watch them do that law and see how people get their shit together. But anywho, Beyonce is going to be on tour. It's happening. Um, far as movies go, so the movie that I cannot get enough of talking about is Ticket to Paradise. It did really good at the box office globally. It's like close to $100 million globally at the box office. Super success. Number two at the box office after Black Adam, um, which I didn't watch with The Rock. That did okay at the box office. Superhero movies are always there. But shout out to the rom-com, okay? So the Lip Brothers, jo George, Josh, and Tremarcus, we all went, uh, and myself went to a, a, a good preview of it was a great opportunity it was uh you know universal nbc all of that um nbc universal comcast all that they are in a part of the same family so they um are the ones helping to push um this film 
And it was a super success at the box office, number two at the box office in the U.S., and also did really well globally. Uh, what's great about that is that it's not a sequel. It's an original film. Um, a lot of films like that don't do that well. Like, that's what I said. That's why it was a big deal when Woman King did what it did at the box office. But um, this is an original film. It's a rom-com. People say a rom-com is coming back. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But what I would say about this film is it's very good. It's very funny. It's very heartfelt. It was, it was better than what I thought it was going to be. And I should have never slept on George Clooney and Julia Roberts because I knew they would not sign up for a corny film. You see the trailer. And some people, when they saw the trailer, they didn't know if it was going to be good or whatever. And the trailer, you feel like you know everything about the movie already. I'm here to tell you that watching this movie, you do not. The movie has a really cool plot twist and some other twists to the film. And it's well done. The acting is great. It's hilarious. It's just a good time. I I, I, I really, really liked it. Um, and highly recommend it. And glad that the reviews and the Rotten Apple scores support that. Because I think a lot of people were kind of wondering like, oh, well, you know, Julia Roberts and them. I mean, this could be corn. This could be a dud. No, they actually brought their star power. And it was just good to see familiar faces on the screen that's not trying to be a superhero. Uh, shout out to that. Because all these mo actors are like all doing Marvel stuff. And, or it's Oscar Beatty. This is a film that's not trying to be super Oscar Beatty either. I think it's just a film that just wants to just be a film. Just to watch and enjoy. It's not meant to take you to space, but it's also not meant to take you to the red carpet of an award show. It's just a, a very simple a uh, film that's just as thoughtful and meaningful and just good quality. It is a great film. Just really, really fun. So Ticket to Paradise, highly recommend it to go see it. Um, we're trying to escape all the extras of superhero films. Now, y'all know Black Panther Wakanda Forever is coming out. Of course, I'm going to go see that movie. But all these other superhero films, I'm not racing to go see them, to be honest. I already saw a good superhero film. and It was called The Woman King, and that was great. As far as everything else going on TV, Abbott Elementary is is everything. The Halloween episode is coming this week. Y'all, I've been waiting for this. I've been telling y'all this is the one that I think is going to solidify their Emmy. I, as a diehard Abbott Elementary fan, also, by the way, they're selling gear now. They have Abbott Elementary, like, swag and clothes now that you can check out and order for all you Abbott fans. But the other good thing about them is they have this Halloween episode. I know you've seen pictures and, and things. This episode, y'all, I think is going to be one for the ages. The Halloween episode will define the future of Abbott and how people will talk about it. It is hilarious. It is iconic. It is going to be one of those episodes. I I will argue that of this season, of this part of the season, this is the equivalent of the episode when Janine's boyfriend goes to the dr school to do the drug prevention rap and how iconic that episode was it's giving that energy so highly recommend it as far as everything else goes you know there'll be more surprises from me but stay tuned to tiktok stay tuned to instagram keep an eye out i will just say that there will be a surprise moment or not surprise moment who knows that will be shaking up the mayoral race coming up there's some big october surprises that have not landed yet but will be coming very soon and as always be well and be best earnestly speaking is recorded in philadelphia pennsylvania and can be found on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts. to stay up to date with the latest on the show follow me on facebook twitter and instagram at mr ernest owens Use the hashtag Earnestly Speaking to tell me what you thought about this episode and check out my website at ErnestOwens.com.